Hey, welcome, welcome, everybody. It's Gettysburg 159. We're back. We're on the first day's battlefield where the first day's fighting actually took place. We hope you've watched our last video and the other six we've already posted, and we hope you'll share this with your friends. We hope you'll not only share it with your friends, we hope you'll go on over to YouTube and give us a subscribe. We're trying to get to 200,000 followers during this anniversary if we can. We're in the 190s already, so share it, and as many people can you know, interact and participate in this anniversary as possible. We are in a place called Herbst Woods, more familiarly known as McPherson's Woods or Reynolds Woods. And on the first day of the battle, of course, you know the Union Iron Brigade came through these woods to engage with Tennessee and Alabama troops under James Archer. That's gonna go well for the Union at first, but then they're gonna break off and the fighting continues. But during this first sort of moving through the woods, as the Wisconsin soldiers are moving through these woods, John Reynolds, John Fulton Reynolds, in command of a whole wing at Gettysburg, he is the guy in command of all the field, maybe eventually commanding 10 or 15,000 soldiers before something bad happens to him. He is the man on the field. He's been leading these operations, and he is somewhere in this vicinity when a Confederate bullet, not a sharpshooter's bullet, there's no sharpshooters around here, although a lot of people laid claim to shooting it, you know, goes in the back of his neck, lodges in or comes out his opposite eye there, and Reynolds is basically killed right as the fighting begins. And when Reynolds falls, Abner Doubleday takes over. Doubleday didn't know what Reynolds wanted to do, and there's the chaos of the Civil War. People are always dying. Doubleday's got to figure out what Reynolds wanted or the best thing to do when someone is taking, taking over for Doubleday, and for that guy, and that guy, and that guy, and that guy. You have hundreds of people doing new jobs during the Battle of Gettysburg, and the modern army has put a fix in for that, so these, these things don't happen if the highest officer gets killed, wounded, or incapacitated, okay? Now, Famously, you could look over my shoulder there and you could see the monument to exactly where Reynolds fell. Now, if you looked a little back when that monument was put up, there was a little sign next to it that said, General Reynolds fell here, okay? The problem about that is, well, they put the monument right where the sign is. The problem is, is that, that, that there used to be a different sign at the edge of those woods about 60 yards from there, okay? And before that, there used to be a sign on a tree right near where we stand here. And before that, someone had carved an R into a tree and carved another R into another tree in this area. And before that, there was a picture taken, um, you know, of a crude R on a tree. In other words, Reynolds died here, there, over near those trees, and over here. Fact is, there's a good chance we might know, but we do have some early accounts. And those early accounts suggest, at least to me and to William Frazanito, that it was somewhere close to this right flank marker of the 151st Pennsylvania. And Chris White's going to talk about them in just a second here. Uh, you got it on the back here. Every time you see a big monument, you see, you'll see it in a second over there. You'll often see flank markers to say where their right flank was and where their left flank was. And, and they did that for us, for future generations to know where these guys made their sacrifices. What I wanted to say before we move on here is that during this uh, Gettysburg 159, Ancestry Fold 3 is providing some special prizes uh, for you. First of all, you can get free access on Fold 3 uh, all the way from now until July 17th. Just go there. You don't need anything special. But we're, they're going to give, give away to some of y'all, um, I think up to three of y'all, full-on Ancestry.com memberships for one year. Also, we are talking about uh, giving away up to 10 shirts, and I have one to model here. I'm not going to put it on, but let me see if I can do my best prices right here. There we go. Uh, so we got Gettysburg Ancestry Fold 3 shirts, and uh, unfortunately for some of y'all, I hope you've been being nice, Sarah K. Byerly is in charge of looking at your comments, looking at the best hashtags, and looking at, 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 at what, how y'all interact with us during this anniversary, and she will decide who's going to win these things. With no further ado, though, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, and Sarah's going to grab the phone, uh, the, grab the camera from Chris, and here comes Chris White. Hey everybody, doing a round robin as usual. So let me get you oriented real fast for those watching from home. Behind the camera, that's Herbst Woods. That's facing, I'm facing due west. Out in that direction will be Willoughby Run, a few hundred yards from where I'm standing, and then out towards Hare's Ridge, Chambersburg, Pittsburgh, and out to the west. Most of the Confederate Army, about two-thirds of the Confederate Army, are coming down the Chambersburg Pike. The Chambersburg Pike's off to my right, just to the north of us. That's modern-day Route 30. If you kept going a little bit farther to the north, you'd run into Oak Hill. That's where the Eternal Peace Light Memorial sits at Gettysburg. It's the only monument at Gettysburg of the 1,400 monuments here with the, with the word peace in its title. Um, and then behind me is East, that's the town of Gettysburg, but more importantly, that's Seminary Ridge. That's where the Lutheran Theological Seminary, which is much larger today, uh, sits. 
made famous when John Buford and John Reynolds meet at Schmucker Hall, um, which is just on the other side of this, this tree that's behind us. We're in a perfect spot that it's blocking it. And I saw Cody and some of the guys over at the Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center uh, up in the cupola today. If you've never gone into the cupola experience, get up there on a day like this. You'll see so far out to the west, to the east. It's re really well worth it. And of course, coming from the south, ironically, will be the bulk of the Federal Army, the Union Army, the Northern Army, the Yankee Army. So into this area comes John Reynolds. As Gary mentioned, he is the left wing commander of the Army of the Potomac. He commands the 1st, 3rd, uh, and as well as the 11th Corps. And he also has under his command John Buford and his horsemen, his troopers. Those guys will start to come up here. Reynolds is going to demote himself from a wing commander of about 40,000 men down to a regimental commander, not the brightest move. And then he is going to move forward with the 2nd Wisconsin when he is shot near us. When he is felled from his horse, uh, the surgeon of the 147th uh, New York, John Sullivan, will come over and examine him. And Reynolds is basically dead before he hits the ground. Reynolds' body is then taken from here, which most people don't don't realize down to what is today Steinware Avenue to the George George House. No, I'm not stuttering. It's not. It's like Ricky Bobby has two first names. <laughs> this one seems to be the same first name. The George George House, which is today uh, the servants old time photo company. That is where his body is going to be laid to rest at first. They'll find a box to put him in a, a uh, makeshift casket, which isn't long enough for him. So they actually have to knock out the bottom of the box and his feet are kind of hanging out at first. He has to go south to Westminster, Maryland. That is the major rail center and that is a supply depot for the Federal Army as they move north. Then to get to his hometown of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is about 40 miles to the east of us, not too far, he now has to take a circuitous route down to Baltimore, Maryland, where his body's embalmed, then out to Philadelphia, and then from the east to the west into Lancaster. That is where Reynolds will be taken and buried the day after this battle ends, July 4th, 1863. Reynolds is the highest ranking Union officer to fall here at the Battle of Gettysburg. Not in the war, because everybody loves to play that game. He is the highest ranking to fall here at Gettysburg. But into this area, we'll also have the 151st Pennsylvania. The 151st was not up here at the time of John Reynolds' death. In fact, they come in as one of the forlorn units. They're part of Thomas Rowley's division uh, because John Reynolds is, is killed. Abner Doubleday, he gets bumped up to a division command, so another person has to take over, or a corps command, then someone has to take over his division, who has to take over brigade. It's a trickle-down effect, as Gary was saying. If you study the Union command here, the high command, it's really overcoming itself at the Battle of Gettysburg because there's so many problems that they have. But coming out here will be uh, Rowley's division. Tom Rowley, Pittsburgher, unfortunately not doing real well today. He's pretty much half in the bag, inebriated. But as, as he starts sending troops out into this area, we'll see one nine-month regiment come out here, and that is the 151st Pennsylvania. The flank marker that Gary uh, pointed out earlier to about the site of John Reynolds' death um, is right behind me. Uh, according to the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, the first real overseers of this battlefield, you had to put in a flank marker anytime you put in a regimental uh, monument. So that's why this ground is littered with these flank markers. They're out here to tell us a story, but only a snapshot of a moment because these are living, breathing organisms moving across the field. It's where they entered the battle. So the 151st, known as the School Teachers Regiment, because they have a lot of school teachers in it, technically should have left the army by now because they're a nine month regiment and their enlistment is expiring. But the 151st comes across this field and they are going to try to stem the tide that is going to be Johnston Pettigrew's North Carolina Brigade bolstered by James Archer and some other Confederate units coming up into this area on the afternoon of July 1st, as the Federals start to stream back towards Seminary Ridge and then eventually towards Cemetery Hill and through the town of Gettysburg. The 151st Pennsylvania uh, is a great example that I like to use out here about time and space on a battlefield. Um, we talk about forced time space when we get out here and do staff rides, how they all interact with each other, and forced time and space come right into it here at the 151st marker. We have an undersized force that's coming out here to take on basically half of a Confederate division. We have um, space that they're trying to take up is not large enough. The Confederates are going to be able to get around them and push them back. And then it is going to be time. The Federals claim that they stood out here for one hour and stood toe to toe with them. In fact, it's probably 15 to 20 minutes. How do we know this? First off, they really 
aren't great at keeping time. We don't have standardized time yet. We also know that if you carry 60 rounds of ammunition into battle and you can fire three aim shots a minute, you're going to be out of ammunition within about 20 minutes. So that's what we start to see out here, that these guys are going to uh, conflate what time they think that they're out here. So when you start reading about these accounts, these guys were in battles for hours or, or whatever, um, sometimes it's true, but many times it's not. It's because the high pressure stress situation that they're in, it's going to start to compound things. It's almost like it's, it's almost like dealing with COVID. Time has no meaning for many people because, over the last two years because it was always the same thing over and over again. Here in the high stress of combat, these people are seeing just about this much of the battlefield. They have blinders on. They're only seeing a small portion of it. So if it's not a general officer and it's these, these private privates or NCOs or others saying, oh, I saw this over here or this over there, they may not have. So always take it with a grain of salt, especially time in the Civil War. I never believe their, their casualty reports. We know they fudge those. And I rarely believe exactly what time it is because Bob may want to wound up his watch and maybe Jim's is running a little bit fast. So it might be 4.15, might be 4.30, might be 4.45. You never know. So those are things I like to talk about out here on the battlefield. And it's a way to engage with these common soldiers. It's something we always talk about, weather and time out uh, when we start talking about folks. And I think Sarah brought up, she wanted me to tell, give you a weather report while we were out here. What is it, about 85 degrees right now. The humidity is about 80%. I'm not sure what the dew point is, but it's rising. So that's your uh, one day forecast here with the American Battlefield Trust. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. We're gonna wrap it up shortly, but man, I'm having a blast with this. You're with the American Battlefield Trust and uh, we are uh, at Reynolds Woods or McPherson's Woods or Herbst Woods. And we're talking about a bunch of things. We have more lives to do and some more static stuff. Uh, to do as well, but people are taking seriously this possibility of some ancestry gifts. First of all, uh, we've got some good hashtags, including a hashtag Gettysburg Minutia, Gettysburg Nerd, and Gettysburg Dork Philharmonic. Pretty good stuff. So people are also trying to be nice. Uh, somebody, uh, Joe, is uh, an ancestry and a trust member and wants a t-shirt though. So I don't know if buttering syrup will work. I think it might actually. We'll see. Chris from the UK says he's really happy to see us, but he, Chris has the neatest beard of any historian on the flip side of that man some people as always don't like that chris pronounces gettysburg properly there are people like me that like to say gettysburg i like the way it sounds but the founder's name was james gettys it's gettysburg so don't call chris a chump for pronouncing that properly please joe mcdonald always seems to find out where we are we hide where we're going to be very well and he stands right next to us and texts and comments that he's standing right next to us. And then lastly, some people would like to call it Lancaster and that one is correct. So Chris is not perfect and nor am I and nor are you. Anything else to add, Sarah, Chris, we good? Everybody, thanks so much for joining us on the ground where the Battle of Gettysburg actually took place and joining us on this live event. Make sure you share this. Make sure you check out our videos from previous years, man. We've been at this, I think, for six years now. So you can go back and check out a lot of what we've done. Please share it with your friends. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you so much for your support of Battlefield Preservation and what? Education. <laughs>